Welcome everyone to our weekly Q&A session with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vanessa Lube. Thank you again for joining us today. Hi, good afternoon to everyone. So my name is Dilshad Berman and I am a writer and reporter with City News and 680 News and I will be moderating this chat today as I have been for the past nine months almost now. Um, if you haven't had a chance to submit your questions over the past week, you can do so under this broadcast and we'll try to get to as many live questions as we can within this half hour period that we have with the doctor. Currently, we're going to start with the questions that we had submitted over the past week and over the past uh, last week as well. Uh, for now, doctor, let's get started with the cache of questions that we have and as they come in live, we'll try and take them. Okay, let's go. Okay, okay. so let's start with a few questions about um, treatments. Um, Florina asks, what treatments are approved and used in Canada for patients hospitalized with severe forms of COVID-19 infection? So uh, some of uh, there's uh, a few drugs that are available um, only for, as you said, those severe hospitalized patients uh, specific for COVID and they're antiviral type, type drugs like an antibiotic is used to treat um, a bacterial infection and antiviral is used to treat uh, this a COVID infection. But also in a hospital, more than just the medications, you're also getting supportive care. If your lungs need help working, you'll be intubated to breathe for your lungs. You'll get fluids so that you don't get dehydrated. So there's a number of hospital measures that are put in place, including some of these antiviral drugs that have been approved for COVID. Okay. Um, and this one comes from Anonymous. Okay. If someone contracted COVID-19, subsequently recovered, and then tested negative twice consecutively in 48 hours after the second test, um, is, is 48 hours after the second test actually safe for them to return to society without the risk of being a vector? Um, they say that they've read COVID-19 tests have not been fully reliable with a wide variance of false positives or negatives, uh, and uh, it may not be able to detect lower thresholds of viral loads. Uh, they say, please explain the science and help ease my concerns with these issues of uncertainty. Yeah, no, a good question. You know, early on in the outbreak, very early on, you actually needed a negative test to go back out. And what we found was people would continue to be positive weeks after, and we knew that they were not infectious. And so the studies have showed that actually after 10 days from when your symptoms started, the vast majority of people are no longer infectious. They can still test positive actually, but they're not considered infectious. Now, the, 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 it's just if you were hospitalized or have a very weak immune system, you could still be positive and be contagious beyond that. But most people, it's 10 days. So that's why we ac actually use a, a test, a, a, um, a time-based clearance. So 10 days, your, uh, your symptoms have resolved or they're getting better, you have no fever, you can be out of self-isolation. We don't actually recommend the test-based clearance for a number of reasons. One is the one that I said, you can continue to be positive but mm -hmm. the other one is as as the viewer has said how can you be sure the negative is a negative that you're not contagious especially if you got two negatives very close after the first one now uh, we do use test-based clearance in certain circumstances like in a hospital um to make sure that a patient is no longer contagious, they can come out of precautions, for example. Um, but the time-based clearance is, I think, more reliable and what and what we use. Okay. Um, so, okay, this is from somebody who actually is COVID positive. David says, uh, "I am COVID positive, but 12 days in, I'm on the mend." My mom has also become positive, and she's a senior citizen. Can I help her and spend time with her? So, um, you know, you just got COVID, you're living with your mom. Absolutely. If you need to help and support your mom, you should help and support your mom. I would suggest that you take your precautions, though, that you would wear your mask, wash your hands, keep your distance as much as possible. It would be very unlikely for, for the, the COVID that you had to kind of reinfect her. She likely got what you got. Um, and you're probably immune in that short window to COVID again. But again, I mean, you could, you don't want your mom to get what we call a secondary bacterial infection. Like maybe, uh, you know, if you have strap or something that you could give to her, that could make her COVID recovery that much worse. And so that's why I would say it would still be important for you to take precautions as you look after your mother. Okay. Okay. Um, so these are questions mostly related around um, public safety and the various measures that we've been taking. So Ed asks, um, 
now that research shows that COVID-19 is probably airborne, why haven't public safety measures been modified for increased social distances, reduced interior space capabilities, and more importantly, higher rated filtering masks? Shouldn't we all be wearing N95s or equivalents now? So the airborne transmission related to COVID is related to aerosols. And aerosols are these tiny droplets when we talk, speak, shout. Uh, the big droplets are the respiratory droplets that we've talked about. The smaller droplets are those aerosols. And because they're smaller, they can linger in the air for longer. But they do eventually get dissipated. The best way to actually deal with those aerosols is uh, through ventilation. It's to making sure that you don't have crowded, a lot of crowding in a room, that the room is big enough, as you've said, and that there's good airflow, because if we actually increase the ventilation in the room, those tiny droplets will be diluted and will be less of a risk. Now, there's no question that an N95 mask is required and recommended in, for example, a setting where you're generating those aerosols. You're suctioning the back of someone's mouth in a hospital. The aerosols are coming multiply. Uh, it, a lot. And so we're in the N95 in that situation is very important. But it hasn't, uh, so far, the evidence is not suggesting that for our day to day, the N95 is required to prevent the aerosols. Those other measures should be good to help prevent the, the aerosol or airborne spread. Okay. Um, let's see a couple more of these public safety questions. Rhonda asks, after more than eight months of pandemic data from Ontario, why are we not able to more strategically address the hot spots uh, with things like contact tracing? Do we know the percentage that is uh, as a result of travel outside the country, restaurants, family dwellings, um, perhaps things like multi-generational homes, uh, you know, schools, that kind of thing? Yeah, so we do have some data. I think, if, let me just first talk about, well, why can't we pinpoint it for every case? When you get COVID, we actually go back 14 days from when you got COVID to figure out where you could have got it from. And it, when you go back 14 days, there may be multiple exposures. You may have gone to school, maybe you worked because you're a teenager, maybe you went to a friend's house two days. And when in 14 days, um, people can do a lot. And that's why it can sometimes be very difficult to say, aha, this is exactly where you got COVID. If you went to a restaurant in there, well, do you think that the restaurant was the primary way or was it more the, the socialization that you had with your friend when you went to your friend's house? It's very hard to prove that, which is why it's very difficult to definitively say this is the risk for these settings. What we do know, though, is that COVID is spread from people. And so if we can limit that contact, if we can say to you today, if you look back at today, what you did in the last 14 days, and you can say, well, in the last 14 days, I was physically distanced from everyone I had contact with, except for this one situation. Well, then we'll say, okay, that was the situation that was most important. So we try and gather that information from contact tracing, but it's not always quite so clear cut. And to the point on travel, I can certainly say that since the borders closed, the impacts of outside of Canada travel, like, um, have been uh, much reduced. Okay, okay. And, you know, on that point of contact tracing, I think uh, for somebody like me, I know I leave the house once a week, and that's it for a physiotherapy appointment. I can pinpoint exactly who I met and what I did. Um, and so unless you can do that, I think, and, and give that information to public health officials, it's really hard to say, where have you been? What have you done? Who have you seen? Yeah, and I think actually it's a really good thing that we can all do is to keep track of where we've been, whether we do that through an app on our phone, yeah. through location services on our phone, or whether we have a calendar feature or whatever, because it can often be very difficult to even recall what you did yeah. um, in the last 14 days. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, um, let's move on. Um, Mary asks, um, do you feel like a proper lockdown would give people more confidence to follow guidelines? Because I'm noticing that a lot more people are just throwing their hands up in the air because they don't know, uh, you know, they don't know all of the measures of the lockdown. They think it's too confusing. We've had that new provincial guidelines with the traffic light system. There's so many different things going on. I agree with you that it is confusing. I think what's happening is we're trying to balance uh, keeping sectors of the economy opening with uh, reducing the spread of COVID. And so that's what's different this lockdown compared to the one in the spring, where in the spring, pretty much, uh, you know, most of the economy was shut down. What I would say to you is thank you for the question. And please encourage those people who you see are not following um, 
the guidelines are not following the precautions, encourage them, tell them it's important, tell them that's the way we're all going to get out of it. I think there's no question that, I mean, we don't know what's down the road. We may have to institute more restrictions, absolutely, especially if we continue to see rising cases, because we know if the cases continue to rise, people are not following the measures. COVID will continue to spread. We've seen that in other countries. We know that that will happen. And that's also what the modeling shows as well. Absolutely. And actually on that related note, you kind of already answered this, but I'll take this question that's coming in live right now. Um, Taylor asks, why aren't we going into a full lockdown like we did last March, uh, this March? Yeah, so I think, you know, right now, uh, the provincial framework where Toronto is in the grey lockdown zone, as lockdown is defined, that's what we're in right now. Whether the lockdown measures need to be more severe, more restrictions, I think, you know, we'll have to wait and see um, what what comes out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's go back to the, the cache of questions that we have here. Um, Jade asks, why is it that churches that are massive in square feet uh, in comparison to a school classroom can only have 10 people, but my daughter is sitting in a classroom with 23 students? So um, the re reduction for places of worship, like a church, uh, has been mostly to prevent that close contact. We have certainly seen in uh, weddings, funerals, uh, uh, services at some of these places where um, maybe the guidelines were being followed during the service, but then afterwards, everyone gives a hug before they leave and then COVID spreads that way. And so sometimes it's those little pinch point moments where COVID spreads, despite doing everything else 95% of the time. So uh, reducing it to 10 is one measure, again, to try and reduce that contact that you have with others. Now, in schools, see, unlike in a church or a place of worship, schools have many, many more layers of public help. Before you come, you have to do the screening tool. If you screen positive, you cannot go to school. Now you're required to stay home. So you don't have symptoms. You screen in, you go to school. Before you enter, you're washing your hands, you're staying only in a cohort, you're not having uh, other close contact with anyone else in the school, the staff are wearing personal protective equipment, the students are all wearing masks in Toronto. So, you know, all of these uh, measures and on and on are what are keeping um, COVID, well, COVID comes into the school, we know that because of community transmission, the spread within the schools is limited. Okay. Um, let's take a couple of live questions that are coming in here. Um, Stephanie asks, has there been research on the effects of masks on young children? Uh, you know, in a society like ours, we actually all as, as a society didn't really wear many masks until COVID hit. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're certainly looking to the literature to see what, uh, what it may show. Um, but again, we have some evidence from the adult literature, from people who wear masks because of their work, who would wear masks all day long, like in a healthcare setting or in other type, construction type settings. And that relationship between masks and uh, adverse outcomes uh, has not been shown, but it's certainly something we need to keep watching, keep looking at the evidence for. Absolutely. And so um, this one is not related, but it, it is a one that we're getting in live right now. Uh, Tabasum asks, are asthma patients also prone to be affected with COVID? Is asthma considered a risk factor for COVID-19? Yeah, so if you have asthma, it doesn't mean that you're more likely to get COVID. If you keep your precautions in place, you can prevent COVID as well as anyone else. However, if you have asthma and you get COVID, you can certainly get a more serious form. You can expect that your asthma will get worse. You'll probably need puffers more. You'll be coughing short of breath, and it can get worse after that. So that's one of the reasons why if you have asthma, uh, you're at higher risk for severe uh, outcomes, for uh, severe reactions to the COVID, and that's why you want to prevent it that much more. Okay, I think that's an important differentiating, fa differentiating factor, though, is that you're not higher risk to catch it. But if you do catch it, you're higher risk to actually have more, a more severe infection. Yes, yes. Right, right. okay, okay. Um, okay, let's go to, back to our cash here. Uh, somebody who just says help, question mark, asks, why uh, is school not locked down but stores were? And what is the point of school being open if we have to be six feet apart? 
So schools are open because we know that uh, the benefits to students is quite high by keeping schools open. We know that uh, students actually suffered a lot from the lockdown and the benefits of school are more than just the education. It's uh, interacting with others, being in school, the socialization. And for some, it's a way that they can actually get other resources, uh, even things like like food in schools as well. Um, and it can be a safer place for a lot of children. And so that's why the, the goal is to keep schools open because there are a lot of other benefits beyond education for school. And despite there being the lockdown where you can't, you know, go to every single store that you want to go to, um, and there's less controls in place to monitor those places, schools are very heavily um, uh, monitored to make sure they're following the public health precautions. We keep a very close eye on the numbers of cases in schools, the number of outbreaks in schools, what we need to do in schools to prevent further spread. Um, and so um, so we're, we're constantly keeping an eye on schools to make sure that they are safer places for children. Absolutely. And I think one of the things, like you mentioned, um, school can be safer for kids, but also something that we've been hearing a lot uh, from parents is that a lot of parents don't have the choice. They do still have to go to work. And so what do you do with the kids if they have to be schooling at home online by themselves? A lot of kids are not independent enough to do that, especially the younger ones, right? That's right. And so those are some of the other added benefits of schools that, that I didn't even mention exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And then more public health questions here. June asks, um, since there has been a 95% drop in flu cases, are they being absorbed into the COVID numbers? And if not, why has the flu all but disappeared? And why are we still being told to get the flu vaccine? Okay, so uh, the flu uh, usually actually hits in its peak sometime between late December and early January. We're into just the beginning of December today. And so usually you start to see more flu cases. Uh, and it's true, our numbers are down. I think we can thank the public health measures that we're taking for COVID to help us prevent the spread of flu. We also have seen a very um, excellent increase in people who have been vaccinated. And that's also helping to keep the numbers of flu down. But we do know that, um, you know, we saw in Australia, their, their season was less, but it did still come. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's still not too late to get your flu vaccine. I can tell you from Toronto Public Health, we actually still have some uh, clinics available and have opened more spots up as well. And so keep in mind, sometimes flu peaks in January as well. And so the season really isn't over yet for flu. And that story is still still ongoing. Right. Still developing for sure. Um, OK, let's move on to. OK, this is an interesting one. Lindsay asks, do people traveling to lockdown zones for work pose a risk to others in their own communities? I think it's well recognized that if you need to travel for work purposes, that's considered an essential reason to travel. I mean, it, it, all along the same lines, if you need to travel for work and cross the border in the U.S., some people who do that for essential reasons don't actually have to quarantine when they come back to Toronto or, or yeah, to, to Canada. So I think the most important thing is, is no matter where you live, whatever borders you're crossing in terms of restrictions, you have to keep those measures in place because what you want is for you not to get COVID and you don't want it to spread in your house or in your community. Right, absolutely. Um, okay, POC asks, this is another what is open and what is closed question. Why have we done nothing about the banks that are still open and seating hundreds of people a day but restaurants can't. Um, the people at the branches cannot be there for something urgent as most banking and even some banks are 100% online. Yeah, so I mean, if you're concerned about a particular bank that you think is not following precautions that maybe has too many people in place and it's unsafe, please uh, let us know. You can always call 311 to report this kind of thing. Uh, those businesses that are open that are considered essential are required to follow public health precautions. So it should never be that even though they're open, there are too many people in there and not following uh, the precautions. Right, absolutely. Um... We've talked about this before, but we'll do this again because I know certain private businesses are requiring um, this now. Nancy asks, people who do not wear masks in public spaces like malls or grocery stores are claiming that they have a health problem. Don't they have to show a doctor's note? 
So the way the current uh, regulation is and the bylaw in Toronto is, is you're not required to show proof. Um, now, we are asking people that if you have a medical reason for, for not being able to wear a mask, I mean, be respectful for those people who truly have a medical reason. But if you don't have a medical reason, please be truthful about that as well. If you choose not to wear a mask, that's a very different situation. If you can't wear a mask, either you choose not to or you can't for medical reasons, we do recommend that you try and find other ways ways to safely get your groceries or get your your prescriptions um calling ahead seeing if you could go in the evening uh you know when it's or go when it's not so busy or getting things delivered because we do recognize that that's a risk for you and also for the others who are around you right absolutely um and just on that note though we recently learned that via rail is actually asking for um a doctor certificate in order to be exempt. So there are still some places and some businesses that are, because they're they're privately run, allowed to to make their own rules in that sense. And so there are some places that will ask you to present a medical exemption note. Yeah, and as far as I know, I mean, Via Rail would be considered federal land, so to right, speak. Yes. So it wouldn't necessarily have to follow the the Ontario or city uh, bylaws. But if you think about a train, um, if you're in a train uh, without a lot of circulation of air, I don't know what their their air circulation systems are. Uh, it's a closed environment. Wearing a mask there would be extremely crucial. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's really why they've put that into place is because if you really can't wear a mask, you've got to have proof. <clears throat> okay, let's move on here. Um, okay, <laughs> this person's display name is Test Test. Um, I'm uncomfortable with the proximity of others and the cleaning sanitation in my dis distillery district condo. What are best practices for, pe for personal safety from infection risk in high density living situations like mine? I always wear an N95 respirator and never leave without my Corona juice that is alcohol sanitizer. <clears throat> Yeah, so I think the most important one is, yeah, wear your mask. Now, if you want to wear an N95, I'm certainly not one to stop you. I think wearing a mask uh, and that it fits properly, right, that it's snug, it covers your nose, your mouth, and your chin, that's very important. So I agree with you. And taking your Corona juice, I love that, your hand sanitizer with you, that's great. Um, I think, you know, making sure that you're not sick before you leave and keeping that physical distance is probably the most important one as well as you leave your place. Now, we do have um, uh, guidelines in place for residential buildings and condos for what they should be doing to prevent the spread of COVID in those uh, settings and includes things like frequently cleaning um, elevator um, buttons and doorknobs, that kind of thing, to make sure that the building itself can be safer. It also includes having a mask policy and making sure that those common areas um, are closed uh, so that there isn't a congregating uh, of people as well. Right, absolutely. Um, okay, let's go to, okay. Chris asks, um, what do we have numbers for those who died strictly from COVID specifically um, and, and, you know, compared to those who died with comorbidities and just happened to test positive for COVID at the time? We don't have those specific numbers. And the reason why we don't is it would probably mean that every person who died with COVID or of COVID would have to go for an autopsy, which is certainly something that many families uh, choose not, not to have. Right. Um, and so that, that's part of the reason why we don't have that. Even if you die with COVID but not of COVID, um, often it can be considered that because you got COVID, the actual infection itself could have been enough to uh, impact you know, what, what your underlying condition was yes. to lead to the death. So it certainly can uh, impact that. But um, we right now in Ontario, we don't have that kind of very specific data. Now, one place to get that is to look at specific studies that have tried to understand that and you can get a sense by percent uh, what, what that might be. Right. And I, I believe you have mentioned that basically w whether or not they die of COVID, if there is COVID, it is counted in the numbers. That's right. Yeah. Right. OK, we've got another live question coming in here. Um, Safi asks, when will the details of the new Pfizer Moderna COVID vaccines be released or do you have more info on the vaccines? She's specifically looking for things like um, ingredients used, like animal byproducts, side effects, things like that. 
Me too. <laughs> I'm <laughs> waiting for that as well, too. I'm waiting for the published studies to like, you know, to really delve into it. The product monograph, it is um, some of it, some of it's coming out. Uh, we're reviewing it. Um, but it is uh, uh, Health Canada is starting the licensure process for it. And so um, I think uh, you can hope and expect that once we have publicly accessible information that we can we can share that. Yes. And I mean, recently we, we heard from the premier that uh, Ontario should be getting doses as, as early as January. Um, and I'm sure, you know, information will be made available so that we can make an informed choice. This is not going to be a mandatory vaccine by any by any standards. That's right. And once a vaccine is available, that means that it's been licensed by Health Canada. We'll have a product monograph in place. And so we'll have all of those answers on what's in the vaccine. What did the study show and those kinds of things. Right, absolutely. Let's do another live one here. Um, Juliet asks, and we just talked about this, but let, let's ask this anyway. Um, since the lockdown, people have been traveling to York Region and other areas to do their shopping. How does this make any sense to close down Toronto and Peel when you can't stop people from traveling between these zones? Yeah, so based on the lockdown restrictions, you are supposed to stay in your zone. And if you're in a higher impact area, you should not be going to the lower impacted areas, mm -hmm. especially for non-essential reasons. I mean, the question that we had earlier was for, for work and work is considered essential. And mm -hmm. so in that case, you can travel. But for all of these other things like shopping, uh, going to the gym, um, they are not recommended. And so if you live in Toronto, you should stay in Toronto for those things. Those things are closed right now. Um, and so we that's the only way we're going to combat this virus. I mean, we're not trying to skirt around the law and find yeah. a loophole and okay, what we're trying to do is to prevent the spread of the virus. And the only way we'll do that is to put restrictions on our, our movement with other people. Right. And I think we've talked about this so many times over the past few months. There's so much to do with the honor system. Like it's, you can't put a border between York region and downtown Toronto. It's not going to happen. You know, we're not going to be able to enforce that. So it has to be one's own responsibility. And over and over, we've talked about personal responsibility throughout this pandemic. That's right. And I think we've seen some of the effects of people crossing the border and ending up, um, you know, getting COVID, spreading COVID. But then at the end of the day, it's Toronto's numbers that increase, you know, and right. so it, it does not help us. Right. And because you've mentioned before, it's not where you get it, it's where you live. And those are the numbers that are counted. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. Uh, let's, this is just a simple question about masks and layering. So uh, I don't have a name for this person, but they say, can I use parchment paper as an additional layer to a cotton mask, like as a filter? Yeah, so we actually um, recommend that, you know, if you have a two ply mask, you can put in um, a filter layer. We're recommending a paper towel or, you know, uh, even a coffee filter might be helpful. Parchment paper may not breathe as well. It might be very difficult for you to wear that. Um, and so I don't think all all uh, kind of pieces of paper will work as a filter layer, but a coffee filter or um, a paper towel will work well. Now you can also buy a cloth material that can be used as a filter. You, you can buy them at craft stores, for example, and then you can cut a piece and put it in and then just rewash re that. And that could be another filter layer for you. Okay. Um, and then I, I, earlier, in the, earlier in the pandemic, we had also heard um, dried baby wipes or, or makeup wipes, things like that, things that have a little bit of porous material, I think, as opposed to like parchment paper, which is completely opaque, not opaque, but like, yeah. Yeah, so you're looking for things that have knitted fibers because yes. that's gonna help stop the droplets, but also that's breathable. And so that's why even the material that the, that, that the mask is made from is so crucial as well. Right, right. Um, okay, we don't have much time, we have two minutes. So this is an interesting one, KK asks, I spent a few hours at M Mount Sinai yesterday on three different floors having tests done, which were not COVID related. What should I be doing now? Should I isolate? Am I at risk of getting it or passing it on? So while you were at Mount Sinai, you were wearing a mask. Uh, the people around you, the healthcare providers that were around you were wearing a mask and face shield, uh, some sort of uh, eye protection. And in between whatever tests you were getting, they would be cleaning and sanitizing the area. So unless you had close contact with anyone who wasn't wearing proper PPE, your risks to actually have of having just gone to the building and catching COVID would be actually quite, quite low. So I think in general, though, um, it's important to watch for symptoms 
symptoms. And if you have even just one mild symptom, a stuffy nose, a runny nose, a sore throat, uh, then you should consider getting tested. Okay, I'm gonna squeeze in one last one if I can. Um, Jet asks, how are we still supposed to believe the numbers being produced by the tests are accurate? My family of five were all tested. Three members were showing who were showing symptoms tested negative, while two showing no symptoms were positive. Yeah, it's a good question. I think as we're seeing, I think our gold standard for the test is the NP swab, the swab that goes deep to the back of the nose. We know that the tests of, you know, just the outside tip of the nose or the throat swab can be less sensitive, so it doesn't always pick up the virus. We know that the, the best time to actually test might actually be in the first few days of your symptoms or even before your symptoms sometimes that you're more likely to test positive. So maybe the three who had symptoms had them for many, many days. That's why they tested negative or it was where the test was taken. But yes, our tests are not 100%. Um, and that's why we have to use some of the data that we collect around who mm -hmm. were you with? Were you in contact with someone? Do you have symptoms to kind of help us as well? Right. And if I remember correct, correctly, that was called pre-test probability. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. How, how, yeah, how likely you are to, 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 to test positive. Yeah, exactly. So, so to, yeah, exactly. Okay, wonderful. So we are out of time. I'm sorry I kept you one minute longer, but this brings us to the end of our AMA session this week. Thank you again, doctor, for taking the time and all the patients and answering these questions. Thank you to everybody that submitted online. And we will have the doctor back with us next week so you can get more of your questions answered. Thanks so much, doctor. See you next week. Okay, bye. Bye.